big thing. Okay? So when we relax those muscles, we're gonna see dilation or expansion. The, large, the radius becomes larger. And when we contract those muscles, we're gonna make it narrow, smaller diameter. Okay? Constriction. Constriction and dilation, we talk a lot about constriction and dilation. Now the arterioles provide blood to the capillaries, and please know these are capillary beds, network of capillaries, and this is when you have diffusion and exchange of materials, nutrients, oxygen, waste, and so on with the tissues. The returning blood, the blue blood as we call it, it's actually more blue than red because of the hemoglobin that is not oxygenated at this point. Is going to venules, the counterpart of arterioles, venules, the small veins that go and merge eventually into drain into big veins that go all the way back to the cavity and back to the right heart and from here to the exchange with the lungs. From now on, I'm going to focus on the systemic circulation. Just remind, remind yourself we also have a pulmonary circulation. Why am I talking about the systemic circulation? Because it's much more challenging if you're a heart and you're a cardiovascular system to send the blood all the way from here to your lower limbs, for example. Any questions about the structure here? Just to make sure we follow the anatomy. The basic, again, this is not the real anatomy, it's kind of like a engineering version. Yes, we do. So Liv is asking a wonderful question. If they become smaller and smaller, how don't become overload? Because you have one aorta and several large arteries, and you have millions of capillaries. So each is getting a tiny fraction of fat solid width. So it's just relative to the size itself. It's the Mississippi, okay? Branching out into big, large rivers, smaller rivers, creeks, tiny creeks, eventually. Okay. Take a look at my laser point right here. This point, no, I'll do it this point. This point here, imagine this is point A and this is point B. What would make blood move from this point A to this point B? What do, what's the driving force? What do I have to have in order for blood to move from point A to point B? I'm gonna have a gradient, great. Gradient of what? Pressure. Of pressure, specifically here, blood pressure. This is true for this point to this point, this point to this point, and this is true for the entire circulation. So to remind us what is blood pressure, we mentioned that when we talked about the heart. Blood pressure gradient is the driving force for blood flow through the body. And to blood pressure, this is a cross section of a blood vessel. It can be an artery or capillary or vein. Blood pressure, P or delta P, if we talk about the gradient, is the force per unit area exerted on the walls of the blood vessel by its contained blood. In other words, if you were a pressure receptor, for example, sensor in the wall, how much blood would you be hit by, right, from the vessel itself? So imagine the wall. We have the same thing in the cardiac case in the heart, but that was the ventricles or the atria. Here we talk about the blood vessels. Please note, it's force their area. The area has a difference. If I am with the same mass, with the same force that I have, will stand on thin ice, or if I lie down on thin ice, there will be a different pressure, right? Because it's spread over a larger area. Okay, take a look here for a little bit and discuss with yourselves where would you expect to find the highest point of blood pressure in the system, the highest. Where is the highest, the greatest point of blood pressure in the whole cardiovascular system? I don't like to call on people, so please, please don't make me do that. I won't do that. No. Okay, anyone from the middle part? In the aorta, exactly, why the aorta? What makes it the greatest or the highest peak? the force that comes out from the ventricle. Remember, we are just pushed our hearts during systole, right? And we pushed 
a lot of blood. The pressure is coming from the blood. So the most blood that goes into the system is right here after systole. That's the greatest point. Where's the lowest point? Right here, right? Coming back to the atria. In the atria <coughs> itself, actually, in the right atrium, of course, not just the atria. What's the pressure, remember? Aroundish numbers. The pressure in the right atrium after it's completely empty. After it's completely empty. What is the pressure extended by the blood, the completely empty blood? Zero, exactly. Zero millimeters of mercury. So that's the lowest. So the pressure is from highest to lowest. Now, when we talk about, this is true for again, any point A to point B, but here we talk about the entire systemic circulation. We're talking from highest to zero. So whenever we talk about the highest pressure and we give a number, we don't need to do this minus zero, right? We just call it the number of the highest. Okay, just because we have zero at the end. That's the driving force for systemic circulation. If we go and measure another systemic circulation, but if we measure this, the blood pressure at any given point during the systemic, so local pressure in that area, you imagine you go and measure pressure in the aorta and large arteries, and then you go and measure pressure in the, con in the capillaries and so on, this is what you'll get. So the highest pressure is in the aorta, fluctuating, we'll talk about fluctuation shortly, okay, but around the 120 to 80. It falls gradually, but please look pretty dramatically when it comes to the arterioles. Continues to drop so all the way until it reaches zero. The capillaries are not the lowest, as many people think. The capillaries are low, much lower than the aorta. We're talking about 18 or so millimeters of mercury. That's the unit. But we have zero eventually in the atrium. So let's talk a bit about the falling part, OK? So we'll just highlight this. It falls gradually. Now, the resistance to the blood flow is friction. If you think about, I'll go back to the example I gave Olivia, the Mississippi River, right? And a creek that branches out. The water in the Mississippi, or the water in any river or creek that you can imagine, right? They are facing all the time. If you're a water molecule, you're facing all the time friction. Friction between molecules, right? In the river itself. And friction where? Especially where? In the edges, in the walls, right? In the ends of the river. That's exactly the same goes for the blood vessels. So the longer the blood travels, the more friction it will encounter. You can think about it in terms of energy. We're starting with, we have kinetic energy, we have potential energy, and kinetic energy that is translated into kinetic energy, the movement. But part of it is dissipated with friction to heat, okay? So as we go on and on and on and on and on, in our almost meters, or maybe yards, let's say that, inches and eventually meters of blood vessels, we're gonna get more and more friction. So if you measure the local potential after the large, and by the way, the, we call the aorta and the arteries, the large arteries, we talk, we talk about them as one unit, elastic arteries. So as we go to the arterioles, we find less. And as we go to the venules, we'll find less because this, there was a lot of friction in between. What is that dramatic drop is? First of all, question about friction and why in general we are losing it. Okay, friction, okay. The second thing is about the arterioles. The arterioles is not just a drop, it's a huge drop, right? So we just said that the longer you go, the more friction you have. Arteries are like this. Arterioles are like this. So how can we have such a big drop in the arterioles? Anyone has any idea? Yes, Rick. Uh, would it be more edges? So like there's like more surface area than it's in? When we talk about the systemic circulation, we're not talking about arteriole in singular. We're talking about arterioles. <laughs> We have much more arterioles than large arteries. There's much more mileage if you take all of the arterioles and combine them together. So there's much more mileage and therefore much more friction. That's the one factor. Okay, so here is one factor. The second factor is written here. We have a smaller diameter, right? So if you are a molecule of water in the Mississippi, 
or if you are a molecule of water in a small, tiny creek, there's a difference in the amount of resistance you're encountering, right? There's a greater chance you'll see the bends of the river, the edges, or the walls of the blood vessels, and therefore more resistance. So this is why we see such a huge, dramatic drop in the arterioles. We'll still have continuing drop after there, but this is where you really collapse from 120 to 80 to about 40-ish and lower. So the arterials show much more resistance than the arteries since they're small in diameter, increased friction, and drop in local blood pressure. Any question about this? This is one of those things that I mentioned that maybe it sounds rational. If you think about it, it's much more complicated than that. I'm giving you a really simplistic story. <coughs> See how? Arterials. Arterials are small in diameter compared to the large arteries. Because it's increasing friction. So in that local potential, and we will go back at the end, not today, on Thursday, to local versus systemic, but in the local pressure, if you go and measure pressure in the creek compared to the pressure in the Mississippi, not in the whole system, the pressure in the creek would be lower because you have much more resistance. You lost a lot of the kinetic energy that came in. Yes, yeah. Is this related at all to why like, sometimes when people stand up, they'll get lightheaded? That's part of the idea of how we need to give up sometimes for the blood to come back. It also has to do with the veins. It, yeah, sometimes. Anything else about this? Yes. Um, because uh, the capillaries are the smallest blood vessels, wouldn't you see the greatest amount of friction? I want, I'll wait for that question. Wonderful. So the question, and remind I should know your name, but you know. It's Ian. Ian? Ian, sorry. So Ian is asking a great question. Wait a second, capillaries are even smaller and we have more capillaries than arterials. Why don't we have the, the drop there? So first of all, let me remind us that arterials come before the capillaries. So the drop was already made. The dramatic drop was already made. That's one thing. Second of all, there is an issue of the ratio. This is when becoming a bit more compli complex. It's not just about the size. It's about how much blood is running there, right? Because mm -hmm. blood pressure is the amount of blood on the walls. So it's true what I said, arterials are, are smaller in diameter, but they also have less blood. But the ratio between how much blood is running and the diameter, the arterials are more resist are actually provide more friction and resistance. Excellent question. I have another one here. Yes. Yes, again, because we're talking about, when we talk about systemic in general, these are local pressures, right? When we talk about the whole system, we talk about not just one arterial, we talk about all of them. So we measure the surface area of all of those arterials. I measured the, the more yards or meters, right, that we encounter. Anyone has any idea? How much, if you take out all the blood vessels and just tie them together and make it just one long blood vessel? How many yards do we have? I mean, we are kind of like six feet plus, right? Like, but how much do we have blood? Anyone can give a sense? When we say mileage of the blood vessels, what do we mean? I mean, it's not miles, right? But how many these yards? Can you control? Don't raise your hand. 200 yards. It was going in extreme. Anyone else? Yards. We have 60,000 miles of blood, two times 0.5 circumference of the entire Earth in each of in every one of our body. That's the amount of blood vessel that you run here. This is all the capillaries and all the arterials and all the arteries. Your blood runs a long, 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 long way. It's pretty amazing, but that's the case. Okay, so we said that here, we talked about the fact that it's not just the highest, but also, it's the highest, but it also fluctuates, right? And you can see it runs from 120 to 80. Like, can anyone suggest, based on what we learned already about the heart, why do we have this fluctuation? Where's that 120 and 80 coming from? Contraction of what? Of the heart, so that will give us the 120, but then where do I get the 80? Why does it stay 120? 
What happens after contraction? Relaxation. Yes. Tell me that in cardiovascular terms. Diastole and systole, exactly. So we have systolic pressure and we have diastolic pressure. So we're gonna go back again to a diagram. This is a different diagram, but again, thinking about it as a system, but now we're gonna focus not on the entire thing, but actually on the large arteries. So first of all, I wanna make sure we understand what we see here. So on one here, this is basically the left ventricle. And we care right now just about the left ventricle because we talk about the systemic circulation. The dashed lines show you the resting state of the left ventricle. In here you have all the aorta and the large elastic arteries as just one basic vessel, if you will, or pipe, okay? You just call them arteries. Then you take all the small arteries and the arterioles and you put them into these small, and you can see they have a smaller diameter, right? Yeah. So this is really, you think about it in a very big picture terms because this is what we care about right now. What do we have in number two, by the way? Something there between the left ventricle and the large arteries? The semilunar valve, right? Specifically the aortic semilunar, semilunar valves. Great. So in the first part, we talk about systole. And during systole, the left ventricle is contracting. It's becoming smaller. And this is why you can see the size here. The blood beginning will not have enough power, enough pressure, but at some point, right, it exceeds the afterload, and then we push open the semilunar valve, and the air will show you where the blood goes. The blood goes, some will continue all the way, but a major part of it is going to the large arteries. And the large arteries are, you can expand them. So they're gonna be getting the blood and expand somewhat. You can see later on that they can recoil, but now we're focusing on their maximum length, or diameter, if you will. This is what we call the systolic pressure. Ventricles contracts, ventricle contracts, seminal valves opens, the aorta and arterioles expand and store pressure in elastic walls. Why do we say store pressure? Because they get, because they get most of the blood, they're basically being hit by most of the blood, therefore force, therefore pressure. Any questions about the systolic? This is the systolic, systolic pressure, Pressure exerted on arterial walls during ventricular contraction in a healthy young person, it's about 120 millimeters of mercury, it varies a lot, okay? And as you probably know, you go and check your blood pressure, they will say it's 120 over 80, perfect, or it's too high or it's too low. That's the way it's coming from. Please note, when we mesh talk about pressure in the system, we talk about arterial pressure, we talk about the pressure in the aorta and the large arteries. We don't talk about pressure in the heart, we don't talk about different pressures in a capillary. We talk about only the large arteries. This is where we measure, because it's the important one. It's the highest point. Any questions about systolic pressure? Okay. Now what happens after systole? So now we have diastole, right? So now we have relaxation of the ventricle. What happens to the blood that was just stored in the large arteries, where is that going to go? Guys, take a look, where is that going to go? Into all the uh, smaller arteries and the arterioles and to the tissues, right? Now, how does it go? One thing we can imagine is maybe we have muscles that contract, right, and squeeze it out like we had in the heart. But that's not the main mechanism. The main mechanism by which the blood is pushed from the arteries and towards the body is by elastic, Recoil. One of the reasons why it's so important for our arteries to be elastic. So it's expanded, now we don't push any more blood, it's recording, it's not collapsing, it's recording. And that pushes blood towards the arteries, that also pushes blood where? To the back throat, to close the semilunar valves and to serve as the afterload for the next cycle. So, isovolumetric ventricular relaxation, semilunar valves shuts, preventing flow back into the ventricle, elastic recoil of arteries sends blood forward into the rest of the regular nervous system. That's the lowest level of arterial pressure during a ventricular cycle, which is around 80 on average. Okay, 
talk too much today. It's time to challenge you a little bit. Okay? So let's think about elasticity for a second. Let's take two scenarios. These are two different scenarios, by the way. We'll think about what importance elasticity has. So I want you guys to think in groups. Okay? What would happen if our arteries were not elastic? In the first scenario, think about the blood vessels as plastic tubes. They're not, in that sense, we're not talking about elasticity as more as dispensability, as the way to the ability to expand. What will happen? What's a potential pitfall? What can go wrong? Why don't we have them as such? That's the first scenario. The second scenario, let's think about diastole. Don't think about it now as plastic. Think about them as a balloon that collapses. What would happen if they were not elastic, that is, coming back to a resting point, but coming back to a zero? Think about the consequences, and then we'll see whether elasticity is important. Okay? Talk with each other in groups. Think about those two scenarios. <laughs> I will see you in two days, Thursday.